Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Linda J. Hahn, and I am the virtual class coordinator for Road at Home. And I am bringing you some interviews with our fabulous faculty for May. My guest today is Judy Kirk, and she is coming from across the pond over in England. And I had to tell you that because you'll, you'll definitely see a, um, a difference in our accents. <laughs> Judy, hello. Hello, Linda. Nice to be with you. Yeah, are, are you excited? You're teaching Road at Home? It, this will be my first time teaching at Road at Home. So I'm, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to do so um, because it's a virtual show. Uh, it's enabled um, tutors from further afield perhaps to, to participate too. And they've been really kind in that they've scheduled my classes so they're not too late for me, allowing for the time difference. What, what is the time difference? It's, we are five hours ahead of Eastern. Okay, and then Pacific would be like eight hours. Eight hours ahead of Pacific, yeah. Wow. So yeah, we're, we're doing our best to um, make sure that we can bring a well-rounded faculty. And um, so let's talk about you. You're over in Canterbury, England. Yes. And you're, you're fairly close to London. Yes, I live, um, we usually say we live about equal distance between London and France. So that that will kind of um, nail where we are, perhaps. In fact, I once had an American friend who said, who introduced me by, to her daughter by saying, this is Judy, she took me to France for lunch, which <laughs> actually was, was about right. That was, that was about what we did. <laughs> wow. And, and you say you have an almost perfect husband who's like your roadie? He is. So, um, I used to help him with his financial services business, but then when I stepped down from that, and now he is semi-retired, so he uh, tends to handle all the tech for me when um, I'm teaching via Zoom. And if I'm teaching in person, he tends to make sure I've got the right stuff in the right place at the right time. So almost perfect. Wow. I'm still training mine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I see you used to work for the legal system. I was a paralegal in my prior life as well. Oh, were you really? Yeah, I yeah. Was, was more on the kind of emotional support side of supporting witnesses through a major court trials. So, um, you know, murders, child abuse, that kind of thing. So uh, quilting was definitely my therapy when I was in that job. Well, let's see, and you're a quilt judge too. I am. I studied for two years with the Quilters Guild of the British Isles. Um, and I think was probably the best thing I ever did as a quilter. There was more personal development taking that course than probably everything else I've ever done Put together I think uh, and so I the, the growth was enormous I think between where I started and where I finished and in fact it gave me the the confidence probably to um, actually teach further afield than I had been doing I'd been like a lot of people teaching locally kind of small time to local groups and that kind of thing. And suddenly I thought, you know what, I think I can do this. And lo and behold, I found I could, which is often the way, isn't it? Do you, do you see a, um, a difference in the trends of Europe and the US quilts? I think there's actually very little difference between the UK and the US. I mean, they have a common, more or less common language. And uh, so much of what we do um, 
is mirrored in the in the USA. So, you know, we take a lot of the patterns, tools, all those kinds of things from the USA. And generally quilters in the UK measure in inches, even though the country is metric. Quilters have stayed with imperial measurements, whereas European quilters tend to be measuring in centimetres. We are still with our quarter inch seams. And I think you can often tell uh, a European quilt. I think you can certainly often tell an Australian quilt. I think their view of colour is very different. I think it's to do with the light as much as anything that they're um, often using very clear, bright colours. Um, more so than those of us in the Northern Hemisphere perhaps do. And I think you can tell Oriental quilts because there's often a psyche of if I've got to, um, you know, put in half a dozen knots into this shibori dyeing, well, I better get started then. Whereas most of us um, in the USA or the UK would run off screaming at the at the prospect. Um, so I, I think there are differences, but perhaps not between the UK and the USA so much. Oh, oh that's interesting. Okay, let's talk about your classes. Okay. Uh, we have on Friday, that is class number F103, doodle quilting. So what's that all about? So this is, um a little sample of a uh, doodle quilting. So basically it's to, to start with a large image and divide it up into sections and uh, quilt different patterns within those sections. So um, the, small sec the small sections cover a multitude of scenes so that the, the designs are so packed that this is suitable for a beginner as well as a more experienced quilter. Um, and there are, you know, some of the designs are simpler and some are more complex. So it's, um, it's one of my favorite classes to teach. It doesn't need a um, huge amount of um, equipment or uh, the no great supply list, are just a couple of fairly small quilt sandwiches. Are, are there any special supplies that you need? I mean, do, do you need... Um... I, do, I do recommend uh, very strongly that students use machine embroidery thread. Uh, I like machine embroidery thread for quilting anyway, but I think particularly in a situation where you're going to be backtracking or stitching over an area that you've already stitched, as we often do, here that we use uh, these lines to, to uh, move from one area to another. Um, machine embroidery thread is, obviously it's designed for that. That's, you know, it's in, intended for stitching out embroidery designs on garments and things. And I tend to find that it, it behaves much better than cotton would if you did that. You know, normally if you're using cotton, you backtrack once your machine and the needle are quite happy. You do it twice and you start to hear that the machine's not terribly happy about it. Third time, you'd start to get really nervous. Whereas if you did it using machine embroidery thread, normally your machine's gonna be perfectly happy to do that. Does your machine need to have any special gizmos? No. Um, I. It, this is free motion quilting, so yet certainly a free motion foot. And I like to use a top stitch needle for free motion quilting, but it's certainly not essential. All right, let's go to Sunday. Sunday is SU110, and that is your Bargello class. So here is my Bargello sample let's look at half of it because otherwise I disappear completely um, this is a, a, a class that seems to be particularly popular it seems to sell out quite quickly 
uh, and it, it's um, it's a design that goes in and out of fashion, I think. Uh, and it it came in back into fashion here oh, about eighteen months ago, I think. And there seemed to be a whole new generation of quilters who had never made a Bargello quilt. So the idea of, of this class was to introduce people to the principles of Bargello. Um, uh, the pattern that I developed, you can put together in three different ways. So you can get three different looks. And along the way, you start to understand how you create those curves and points and so how you can design Bargello patterns for yourself. Um, is there any anything special you would need if I was going to take the class to the three iron? Like less sorry. <laughs> the supply list is um is a is a bit more fairly obviously because you need more fabric. Uh, in particular, to make this design work, you need two strips of each color. So you can use a jelly roll as long as there are two strips of each fabric within the jelly roll. And I do have uh, kits as an option for the class. And they are currently with my friend in Pennsylvania so that they are in the USA and there sh shouldn't be any risk of them being held up in customs or anything of that nature. Okay, that's excellent. And you know, what do you, what would you put your skill level for the Bargello? I think if you can sew an accurate quarter inch seam, you're good to go. It's, it's, um, it's looks like a complex technique, um, but it's not that difficult to do. And there's a few, as there often are with classes, there are a few hints and tips along the way to make life easier. Yep, that's, that's why we do what we do. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So you you have uh, one more. Uh, you're doing a lecture for us on Sunday. That is right. S U L zero one, and that's twenty five years of tips and tricks. How about, want to tease me with a tip? Uh, yes, we talked earlier about using uh, top stitch needles. Uh, if you actually look on the Superior Threads website, they don't produce a quilting needle. They recommend top stitch needles for everything. And certainly years ago when I started using top stitch needles, it cured pretty much any kind of thread issue I'd ever had. And that included working with invisible thread, metallics, everything. So I think for the price of a packet of needles, that may do much the same thing for um, other people as well. And that seems to me like a really simple thing to try. You know, it's not you don't need extra experience to do it. You just need a few dollars to buy a packet of needles. And, and it's always good to have needles. You yeah. never know when you're going to break them. Absolutely. So uh, what, what would you like uh, people to know about you uh, before they take your class? Ooh, let's think. Um, that's that's um, always a hard one. That always makes me Yeah, that's it. I should have anticipated this question, shouldn't I? Um, I, I think I've been teaching Zoom classes for more than a year now. So I'm uh, an experienced Zoom teacher and I've taught uh, a lot of classes, including to American guilds. So, um, you know, there are... I am well versed in American as well as English, but I do tend to constantly confuse myself with who says batting and who says wadding. Oh. And I, I try and remember Americans play baseball, so it's batting. Um, but I have a tendency for British audiences to start talking about batting when I should be talking about wadding. 
Um, and in my experience, you know, United States is a big country and, and language in one part of the country is not necessarily the same as in another part of the country. So if I start talking about one quarter, often um, depending on where I'm teaching in the USA, they'll say, oh, that's one fourth for us. But if you go to Pennsylvania, then they are very familiar with one quarter. So it just depends on, on where you come from. But I'm a, a very relaxed teacher. Um, you will have guessed by the title of my presentation that I have been quilting a long time. It's actually fast approaching 30 years now, I think. And I usually take an attitude of um, the longer that you've been a quilter doesn't mean you make any less mistakes. You just learn other ways to fix it when you do make the mistake. So hopefully that's what I can bring to my classes, ways to fix it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, 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 I'm just going to go a little bit beyond this conversation. When you have a Coca-Cola, what, what are you drinking? Oh, we're just drinking a Coke. But if you said to me, would you like a soda? I'd understand what you were talking about. And if I was in the US, I would use the same word. I just wouldn't hear because most Brits wouldn't know what you were talking about. So, yes, you know, I tend to, I think you know, language is about communication. And if you're in a country and you know what the word is, you should be using it. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't dig my heels in and say, no, it's a pavement, because if you're in America, it's a sidewalk. And so that's the word you should be using. I, I have a friend um, down here in Florida and she is from uh, Britain. And uh, whenever we're talking, I'm always asking her, so what do you, what do you guys call this? <laughs> we go back and forth. What what does this mean? I'll text her. What does this mean? So very occasionally, I have um, a very good friend in Pennsylvania, and um, and normally we do not have a language problem between us. But I said to her one day, oh, "I'm going to take my brolly," and she had no idea what I was talking about. And it's um. It's a slang word for an umbrella in the UK, oh. and I've no idea why we say brolly. It has very little association with umbrella, but hey, that's how it is. I, I, I won't even say what I thought it was. Kelly, <laughs> <laughs> it'll edit me out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, hey, let me go over your classes again. Um, we have F103, which is Friday, class 103. That is doodle quilting. And it looks oh, well. kind of fun. I like, I actually like that. It's kind of fun. Uh, we have SU, which is Sunday, 110, which is Bargello. Is, is it Bargello? Bargello with a J or Bargello with a G? You know, because of my accent. Right? I mean, it, it's spelled with a G, but pronounced with a J, I think. So I think it's Bargello. Okay, so I'm doing it right. Bargello. Yeah, Bargello, uh, SU-110. And then also on Sunday, we have SUL-01, 25 years of tips and tricks. And I'm sure you're going to learn something from there. I'm sure you're going to learn something from there. So, Judy, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing about your classes. It's been a real pleasure to chat, Linda. Thank you. And um, anytime. And we hope to see you uh, really soon at Road at Home. So everybody, please, please get your shots. Keep wearing your masks. Keep washing your hands so we can get back on the road and get back to normal. So Linda Hahn. Coming to you from Florida. And Judy Kirk coming from across the pond in Canterbury, England. We'll see, see you, you soon. soon. Thank you.